Okay, so we're talking about what's new in LiveView. So thanks for virtually joining me. Uh, so, you know, a lot of my last uh, several talks, at least, have been LiveView related. Uh, so we won't have any, you know, 60 frame per second rainbow demos today, but we will have some um, small demos just showing some of the recent features that we've been working on. Uh, because LiveView has seen um, incredibly rapid development uh, this year. So starting in January, we kind of uh, set a goal to get Phoenix 1.5 out with um, a bunch of LiveView features that were necessary um, to really take it to the next level. Uh, we were hoping to ship Phoenix 1.5 and these LiveView features sometime around April, and, and we hit that target. So we have been relatively quiet about a lot of the small features and smaller developments that have landed in the last several releases. So unless you were checking the change logs, uh, you, you know, you haven't seen these in a video, you haven't seen them in guides yet. Uh, so uh, this talk is really about the features that have landed and um, kind of how LiveView takes it to the next level because we've, uh, we've seen a lot of other communities and, and languages kind of uh, embrace this whole idea of server rendered HTML. Uh, so LiveView has kind of seen this uh, or led the uh, the charge in bringing uh, client interaction uh, back to server rendered uh, applications. Uh, so my goal is to show you kind of where we've been and how kind of we take it to the next level and and do it better than everyone else. Uh, so before I get started, I always have to plug Dockyard. Um, so Dockyard supports me in my open source development. Uh, we are a full uh, service uh, consultancy. So from design and development, um, do everything. We work with uh, small startups up to Fortune 100 companies. Uh, so they are what allow me to kind of balance my life out and work on open source. And uh, check us out if you need help on your Elixir work. We'd love to uh, work with you all. And before I start talking about features, I do want to plug the Phoenix site had a redesign. Uh, so this was a part of our big 1.5 release. You know, Phoenix is like six uh, plus years old now. So it was time for uh, a, a refreshed website and also a refreshed tagline. So if you're familiar with our old tagline, it was productive, reliable, fast, which is still true. Uh, but we thought uh, we'd uh, put a, a new spin on things. Uh, so our tagline now is peace of mind from prototype to production, uh, which has some awesome alliteration that I'm a big fan of. Uh, but the goal here is uh, this whole, whole idea of peace of mind is about, you know, why you're developing you, uh, you know, if you're, if you're coming into web, web development today, there are, uh, you know, a myriad of tools, uh, complex build chains, you know, reproducer of builds are difficult. Uh, so just getting into web development and building something today can be extremely complex and challenging. So this idea of peace of mind uh, is about development as far as getting in, building something robust uh, early, whether you're using Live View or just regular Phoenix, you can get started quickly and have a peace of mind during development. But also once you go to production, you have this peace of mind that this thing that you built, maybe as a beginner or a new team uh, that you kind of threw together, so to speak, is gonna scale well, it's gonna be robust and you're kind of backed by the, the business of the platform. So peace of mind is something that we see from, you know, whether you're in development phase or in production phase. Uh, so check the new website out. Uh, it's got a big focus on, on live view and some of the more exciting features like the live dashboard and metrics. Uh, so we're really happy with how that turned out. And I have to uh, plug uh, Jose here for this uh, Live View test revamp. So if you were using Live View prior to, uh, I think, 0, uh, 11, uh, there was always a Live View uh, test uh, module so you could test drive your Live View. So that was always there as soon as we uh, open Live View up. Um, but the API that I shipped kind of uh, left something to be desired because what you had prior to this was if you wanted to test, let's say, clicking on a button, you could send that event to your live view and test that the live view said, yes, I handle this click event. Uh, but th that didn't guarantee that the user actually in the browser would even see some DOM element that would send that click event. Uh, so there, were this, there, were, there was this disconnect here where you still wanted, you know, like a headless browser end to end tests. Uh, so what Jose did was he uh, extended that API and now we have more of a DOM query selector based approach but without using a headless browser. So in this example here, you're mounting a live view and then you can say, uh, pipe to this element function and give it a query selector. So I can say, okay, find an element on the quote unquote page uh, given this query selector. So here I'm just finding the, the first button on the page and I expect it to have the text increment. And then that will uh, create this element uh, structure and you can do different things on that. So here I can actually say, uh, simulate a click event and give me the rendered result. 
And this is going to do what it did prior. So it's going to actually send the click event to the server, but it will also uh, guarantee that there was an element in the DOM uh, that matched that query selector in text. So you're getting um, effectively headless-like browser testing without all the complexity of headless browser testing. So if anyone has done, um, you know, spinning up headless Chrome in the background, uh, in my experience, that's never been uh, it's never been a, a fun experience. It's always slow. It's always super brittle. You have tests that are super flaky. Uh, so here we're giving you the guarantees that this uh, DOM element exists and it exists with these certain attributes and it, it has a you know a Phoenix event that went to the server, uh, but we're doing it uh, incredibly quickly without actually having all the complexity. So internally, we do parse the DOM. We're using uh, Floki under underneath. So we're actually looking at the HTML structure. We're running an Elixir uh, live view client, just like what's running on the browser in JavaScript. Uh, and likewise, we do the same thing for uh, all of these um, uh, ways you can inter interact with your live view. So render submit is a great example. If you have a form on the page, uh, now we will actually guarantee that the payload that we provide here, we're saying set the degrees to one, two, three, but we will guarantee that there is an input with a name uh, degree and we will raise otherwise. So your test is going to be robust and actually guarantee that these elements and form inputs exist on the page. So you can guarantee that as a user, um, you know, even if your server responds to uh, having the degree payload, you'll guarantee that the page content actually had that uh, in place. And it will give you nice error messages when that fails. Uh, so one example here is if I ran a test looking for, let's say, an anchor with a te with the text filter edit post, and I had an anchor, but it just said edit, it will actually raise uh, in the test suite and say, uh, we didn't find anything matching that text filter. And it will give you the DOM elements that it found and you can uh, quickly see what you got wrong. Uh, so this is just one example of um, one of the great, or some of the great features in the uh, test library. So I think uh, folks are, I, I saw a tweet, I think yesterday about, um, you know, they said like the days of headless testing are over. So people have been really excited by this and it made testing much, much better. So thank you, Jose. And then another uh, feature that people have actually really uh, been excited about, it's a very small feature, but it's uh, co-located templates. Uh, so um, Jose and I kind of uh, butt heads initially with LiveView on whether to uh, co-locate your uh, HTML uh, template in a render function directly by your Elixir code in a LiveView or to pull it out into a separate template file. And um, both work in well in different scenarios. So if you're writing like very small templates or very small components, it's nice just to write like a sigil L uh, right inside your Elixir code. Uh, but if that is a really large template with a ton of HTML, it gets unmanageable. So uh, I think we, we settled on that, you know, both use cases are valid, but you definitely have scenarios where you want to offload this to a separate template file, absolutely. Uh, but having to do that, Previously, it was required a lot of ceremony because if you didn't have, you, you would have to create a regular Phoenix view. So you'd have to go create a new view file, create a new directory in your templates directory just to render this template. Uh, so what we allow now is you can just define a file, the same base name as your live view. And if you don't define render, we will just look for that template and pre-compile it into the live view. So uh, there's not a whole uh, lot of fancy features there. It's just you can co-locate, uh, if you have a page live EX, you can define a page live HTML uh, LEX file and it's just going to work. Uh, so if you want to do something more advanced than that, so some people uh, end up asking, well, I want to render multiple templates. Uh, can I just collocate those as well? So that's when we still recommend defining an actual regular Phoenix view and then it can encapsulate everything required for, for those multiple templates. So you can graduate up to a view, but then you can opt in to uh, defining that thing. So this is a nice convenience feature and I use this all the time. And I, I won't show these. I think we've uh, we've seen them. We saw them in my um, my build a Twitter clone 15 minute video. Uh, but I, I did want to touch on that the the live view generators were a big feature that was required uh, in, in my book to get Phoenix one and five out uh, because it's not just about uh, using live view. It's showing people how to use it, especially if they don't know what it's all about. So the Mix Phoenix Gen Live is like a CRUD generator. Uh, for live views. So you'll get the context, you'll get your Ecto schema, everything that you would expect, just like the CRUD HTML generators, but it's using live view under the hood. Uh, you can edit and get real time validations uh, without refreshing the page and what you would expect with a live view interface. 
So it's just a nice way to hit the ground running. So I recommend folks start here if they want to see what LiveView is all about versus just kind of uh, trying to dive in and, and figure it out on, on their own. And another feature that uh, Jose uh, shipped recently, or did all the hard parts, uh, I had to write the JavaScript, <laughs> of course, but um, uh, we added static asset tracking. So uh, this is a really neat feature that most folks uh, probably don't think they need, but uh, once you need it, then it's gonna be there and it's gonna make your life much easier. So imagine uh, you have a uh, web application and you ship a new feature in your live view that renders uh, you know, some kind of different content. And imagine that different markup content has new CSS classes that you're deploying. Uh, well, what, what's gonna happen is if you, we don't do a hard refresh. So if you do a cold deploy, the live view is gonna disconnect and it's gonna automatically recover and reconnect and get that new HTML and it won't have a new style sheet or won't have your new JavaScript bundle that's required. Uh, so this is a real problem that folks have and what we allow now is you can annotate any asset that you want to be tracked with a PHX track static. So in, in this example, you have a, let's say your main application style seat in your main uh, JavaScript bundle can be tracked by default. And, it, and it's opt-in because there's a lot of assets like images that you don't care if they change. Uh, but we, in the default layout that we generate, we'll track your uh, CSS and JavaScript bundle by default. And then what LiveView does is when it connects, it will send up those uh, digest uh, hashes to the server and it will compare with the digest on the server and if it's out of date, it will uh, allow you to react to it. Uh, so we don't do anything for you by default, but we give you the ability to react to this. Uh, so I wanna show a demo of this to show how it works because it's gonna be application specific. You may wanna just perform a hard refresh on the page using a JavaScript hook, or you may wanna show the user a message like, you know, this page is out of date, um, you know, save your work. We'll allow you to handle it, but we don't handle it for you. Uh, so. Let me make sure the app's running here. Yeah, so I have a, just a stock Phoenix app here to, to show this off. And if I go into that template and page live, uh, imagine we have uh, the requirement to handle the application um, JavaScript or CSS changing. Uh, I'm not gonna do a hard refresh, but you could, you could define a hook to do that. But what you can do is you can use a new uh, static change function. And I can ask, is this, did the socket uh, have any of its statics change? So did anything that the client had as PHX track static actually change for this live view? And if it did, I can react to it. And this, sorry, this would be an if. And this is where you could have a hook, just do a hard refresh of the page and then you're done. But let's just have it show, you know, uh, your page is out of date. Uh, please refresh. I save this, uh, not, nothing's going to happen because uh, my assets aren't out of date. So I need to simulate like a cold deploy. Uh, so what we can do is I can, I need to start the server up in production mode first. So that was in development. So let's let this run. I have to build my node assets, start the app. Okay. So now we're running in production. Let's simulate a cold deploy. Uh, so I can say, there's just a, a command here I have to simulate a cold deploy. Uh, let's see. Uh, so this is just going to go through and uh, I'm gonna simulate that I bumped some application JavaScript bundle and then I'm gonna want to call node to build the assets. I'm gonna call Phoenix Digest to digest the assets and I'm gonna start the server in production mode. So if we do that and we go back to the application, we can see that it's trying to reconnect now and let's see what happens when it reconnects. That live view on the client is saying, oh, it reconnected and it sent the digest up and it realized that one of those assets, the JavaScript bundle in this case had changed and then the live view if condition ran and we get our message. Uh, so it's there when you need it, but like I said, it's one of those uh, features that is necessary once you have these uh, things out in the wild. And as we see more and more people use live view in production, we get this, this feedback from the community and this is one of the, um, feature request that came out recently and it's, it's a super slick feature to have once you need it. So pretty cool to have that in place and see that work. And like I said, it's only going to send up the assets that you annotate. So you have to opt into it, but that's the way it should be. And another uh, small feature that I don't think we've uh, talked about anywhere yet other than the changelog is the ability to 
trigger a form, a regular form action to like a, a controller from a live view. So what we had was people had a, a requirement to, let's say for login and registrations where they wanted to use live view, but they needed to write to the cookie session. And writing to the session is impossible over WebSockets. Uh, it's just, you, you can't do it uh, per the spec. Uh, so they would have to ditch live view and write a regular controller. Um, and the, the problem with that is that they didn't get their real time rich interactions or validations. So what Phoenix trigger action gives you is the ability just to say uh, PHX trigger action and you can give it a uh, true or false Boolean. And what, what you can do then is say, I'm going to define a form and give it an actual, uh, you know, a post uh, path here. So the action would be password reset path. And then I can use my normal live view um, submit and that live view submit is going to intercept the form submit. So in this case, I have like a handle event save. If I perform, uh, instead of saving or registering the user or doing the password reset, I just validate it. If it's valid, I can then assign some assign like a trigger submit, whatever you want to call it, assign that to true. Once that rolls over to true, the client, when it patches the DOM is going to see, oh, now I should actually do a real form submit. So it's like a two-step submit where it, you click submit, it submits the form, but LiveView takes it over. And then if you render that form with a trigger action, it will then do a, a submit over HTTP to a controller. So it's a way for you to kind of do uh, pre-submit pre validations and then pick it up on our controller, do your persistence, do your session writing and redirect back um, to a login screen or to a welcome page. Uh, so it's a slick feature pe for people that wanted to use live view, but also needed the ability to, you know, handle uh, session uh, updating. And one of the big pushes uh, over the last several months is making sure live view was a, a good citizen on the web. Uh, so you hear me say that throughout the rest of the talk where our goal is not only to be a reasonable option for people building, you know, rich applications, it's, we need to be an extremely compelling option. And, and that means actually pushing people towards building proper uh, user experiences. So one of the, one of those, uh, one of aspects of that is giving user feedback. So, you know, people talk a lot about latency, um, you know, how, if you have, if the user has to go to the server for every, every interaction, isn't that going to be a bad user experience? And the answer is like, it could be, but it depends because a lot of single page applications require a, a round trip to the server anyway. Uh, so there's no difference there. Uh, so our goal uh, for live view is to make sure that by default, we're providing the user feedback. So whether they have to go to the server to persist something or to uh, go to some, you know, next uh, page on a form wizard, they're going to get feedback instead of just waiting on a bad connection. So what we do by default is we trigger uh, a page loading event for forms, but for any other uh, Phoenix interaction, uh, you can annotate the container with a PHX page loading annotation. And in this case, uh, the modal that we generate in our live generators uh, shows this, where you can say anytime this modal is clicked to close it, or anytime an escape key is clicked, uh, or sorry, is pressed to close it, we're also going to trigger the page loading events. And then in your application JavaScript, you can react to those events and update the UI in some meaningful way. So out of the box, we use the in progress library where you can just listen to uh, PHX page loading start and stop. And in, in progress, we'll just show that top loader bar. Uh, but out of the box, we support this and uh, highly recommend that folks use uh, some kind of main page interaction because it's necessary to show users that you know some uh, something's happening while they're waiting on latency. And along with that uh, comes our acknowledge acknowledgement-based UI updates. Uh, so this is a feature that you don't really need to worry about as a user. You just need to uh, to know that it, it's there. So along with this comes CSS loading stage, which which you should know about. But under the hood, this is powered by a pretty uh, unique feature that we haven't seen other live view like frameworks uh, implement yet. So the problem that you have today uh, with, well, the problem that you used to have with live view and that you'll have with uh, this approach is you could have uh, client interactions that are raced by an in-flight request uh, from the server. Uh, so I have one example here where imagine I have a form where I'm uh, allowing people to submit offers like a, a bidding site or someone that can offer um, a dollar amount for something I'm selling. And let's say this is in a live view and I have a button to accept that offer. Well, what can happen is imagine you click accept offer and there's some latency there. And imagine while you, after you click accept uh, in flight, a uh, new offer uh, is coming over the wire. So 
while you're waiting on your accepted offer, you would just see the current offer that you accepted change in value. And that's a problematic user experience. Uh, so the server, you know, is still going to have to figure out what the latest offer is, but from a end user experience, that'd be a broken experience where they, you know, if they click to persist something or they click to accept an offer. And then while they waited on that submission, the UI just changed to something else, especially when we're talking dollars and um, that could be a surprising experience. Uh, so what we'll do on the live view side is we internally uh, add uh, CSS loading states with a, a unique reference. Uh, so this data ref that you may see in your markup from time to time is a way for us to tag uh, elements that can't be touched until we get an acknowledgement for that interaction. Uh, so this is critical because any in-flight request now for this form or this button uh, won't be applied when we patch the DOM because we'll actually wait for the acknowledgement uh, to come back over the server. Uh, so you won't have these race conditions anymore and it will also give you nice loading states because we add, for example, a PHX submit loading or a PHX click loading. We, have, we add CSS classes to these interactive elements so you can provide the user feedback immediately. And then when, when the acknowledgement for that interaction, that click, that form submit comes back, we reset the classes. So you can, you can give users uh, instant feedback and also avoid these race conditions. So the, as the end user, you just need to know about some CSS classes that you can define, um, but under the hood, this is powered by actual unique uh, acknowledgement tracking. Uh, and I had an example here. Imagine uh, we, we tagged it with ref2, but we had an acknowledgement come back down or an event for an older reference updating the current value. We would ignore that. And I wanna show a demo of that because we also shipped uh, some latency features. Uh, so if you expose your live socket on the client on, on window, you can enable a latency simulation. Uh, so if we enable some extreme latency here, let's say 10 seconds, just so I can show you how this works. If I click this uh, button here, we can see it immediately dimmed because that loading class was applied and then the text changed on it. Uh, so internally now we have a disable with kind of like optimistic UI and there, there it rolled back over. Let's just try it again. And we can see that we tagged it with this unique reference and the CSS class uh, Phoenix submit loading was applied. And if we had any other update come back before now, that would still stay until the acknowledgement came back. Uh, so I highly recommend folks uh, use the CSS loading states uh, to build proper uh, web applications. Our live generators give you that by default in the, the main uh, application style sheet that we generate for new apps will have some basic examples. It just dims the, uh, it dims the click thing by default, um, but that's there for, for you to override. But the goal is a user should have a proper experience regardless of the latency. And you can test drive that by enabling the latency simulator uh, on the client. And I'm gonna disable it. Otherwise, uh, some, this will last throughout the, the browser session. So if you forget to uh, remove it, then sometimes it's surprising. Okay, so kill that. And then another feature that uh, we didn't talk about, but we do generate for new applications is a live title tag. So if you're using live navigation, uh, we don't allow pat patching the root, the root layout. So things like the uh, HTML uh, head aren't accessible to you in your live view. And, and if people some often request the ability to patch the head. Uh, we tell them then they should just go to a, a regular link to a, a new page with a different layout uh, because patching the head is problematic because you have, uh, you have you know, multiple scripts that are now on the page that wouldn't be on a hard refresh or multiple style sheets. So we just recommend uh, if you need a different layout, you should just go to a new page. But you do need the ability to update the title tag when you're using live navigation in the same layout. Uh, so in, you can just define uh, in your layout live title tag. And then we have a special uh, page title assigned that controls that. Uh, so all you have to do is assign page title and it's just gonna work as you would expect, just like kind of a stateless uh, render. Uh, but the cool thing is you can dynamically assign that. So at any time, let's say you wanted to show a notification in the tab bar like Twitter, when, there's, when you tab away and there's new tweets, it will show you like how many unread tweets there are. You can do that. You could just say assign page title, uh, interpolate some count, and it's just gonna update the title bar. And that's just going to work as you would expect. Like anything else in live view, you know, you assign some data and, and, and the UI is gonna update. So we can do that real quick. If we go to page live, uh, just the stock Phoenix app, uh, as I'm typing, you know, I don't, this isn't a, 
I don't know why you would do this, but we can say, you know, assign page title, that special assign. I can say, you know, uh, search for, you know, they're trying to search for hex packages. So I can just say search for, I'll interpolate the query. Why not? If I go back to the browser and I start typing, I need to actually have a tab open so you can see it. Is it not going to work for me? Really? Oh, I'm in production. That's why. Code reloading isn't enabled in production, so. How many people saw me mess up? All right. Okay, so now as I'm searching, you can see the title bar here is going to update with whatever I want. So, you know, you, you don't necessarily want to implement a auto updating on KeyPress uh, title bar, but you could have PubSub running in the background. And then as uh, new events are coming on the page, you can show the number of notifications that they haven't read. And then the on page focus, you can react to that and then clear the notifications. So it's a neat way to uh, get some of these like single page app like features just by assigning a page title assigned on the server. And then another small feature was uh, a complaint that people had was if, if they were defining a, a component and they wanted to have that component handle an event instead of the parent live view, they had to explicitly target that component. And the only way to do that previously was to define some DOM ID and then target the DOM ID somewhere in that component. Uh, so it wasn't bad if you already had some uh, DOM ID to target, but if you didn't, then you would have to sometimes go add an ID just to target the component. Uh, so we added the ability to use this uh, myself assign, which is internally is going to uniquely track that component. But all you need to know is you can just say PHX target myself and that event's going to go to the component. Uh, so it's a, it was a convenience uh, feature, uh, but this has um, been, been largely rejoiced for folks using a lot of components. So definitely, definitely check that out if you haven't. And then another thing I wanted to touch on was uh, live actions. Uh, if you've seen these, these won't be news to you, uh, but live view or live routes previously didn't have this idea of an action like a, a controller action has. And uh, before this, your live routes just had, you know, live post to post live index and that was it. And with live action, we gave you this um, uh, separate, you know, piece of, of data that tells you um, kind of the, the context of what's happening for that live route, just like a controller action. And this is nice because you can get kind of reactive uh, URL handling within a live view and it's just going to uh, work as you would expect it to work. And not only that, it's going to give you first class URLs that provide like a proper user experience on the web. So if you imagine a lot of single page apps, if you open a modal, you know, you, you sort some, uh, item listing and you do a hard refresh or you open in a new tab or you share that link, oftentimes in my experience, that state is lost. It was just ephemeral client state and you don't have repeatable URLs. Uh, so with Phoenix Live, you really push people towards first class URLs that get you back to where you were. Uh, so part of that is this live action in the URL and you can then drive that from your live view. So, or you can use rather the action to drive your live view. So imagine uh, you, have, you have some CRUD-like live routes, like post goes to the index live view index action. But then if you want to show like a new tweet modal, for example, you wouldn't want to go to a new, a new page or just want to show a modal like Twitter and you type in your new tweet. So we don't want to go to a new live view or start a new process, but we'll just go to that same uh, index live view, but with some new action. And then we can react to that. So in your post live index live view, you can then uh, drive the live view based on whatever the live action assign is. So that's just going to be updated internally based on the URL as it changes. So you'll see code like this in our live uh, generators where, you know, handle params is invoked anytime uh, it's invoked directly after mount and it's invoked anytime uh, the URL changes uh, via push state live navigation. So then you can say, okay, if the params have changed, I'm going to, call a function that handles, let's say the edit action. And that's where I can edit the page title, fetch some data specific to editing that post or you know, show a modal. And as the URL bar changes, 
you're going to change your state and changing your state's going to re-render a template and then you can pick up and kind of have the reactive approach on, on the template side as well. Uh, so one example of that is again in our generators where you can uh, say, okay, if the live action assign, again, the live action is an assign that we set for you uh, based on the live route. You can just say, if the live action is a newer edit, then I'm gonna render a, a form component inside a modal. This is what we generate for you by default, but you can see how we push you towards, like the simplest thing is going to be the correct thing as far as user experience goes. Whereas this URL bar is changing, you're just going to uh, have your uh, template update and you're going to have a proper URL and it's all driven off of live action. So by doing that, you have repeatable URLs, you can open them in new tabs and everything's just going to work. Uh, so it's, it's not like mind blowing, but I, I wanna stress to people like this is critically important for us to have you know, a proper experience on the web to have live view actually be you know, a, a, a extremely good experience because the goal is like I said, not to be like worse is better, it's to be better is better. Like it should be better than a single page app um, with less effort. So part of that is, you know, the, the easy thing should be the correct thing. So imagine I click edit here. Now my URL bar just updated to slash edit. I stayed in the index live view, but if I hard refresh, it looks, it looks exactly the same because that code path that was using the live action based on the URL went through the same code path, right? I didn't have to worry about like, okay, I have this implicit client state, or if I open this in a new tab, the same thing's going to happen. Likewise, if I click back and go forward, it's using push state. It's not doing a full page request. And it's just going to work because if I click forward here, handle params gets invoked. I call the function that sets the title to edit post. And then that renders a template that if condition gets reinvoked, but everything's driven off the URL, which is driven off the live action. So I just want people to internalize this, that the goal is to have, you know, proper URLs and a proper experience on the web. And when we give you that out of the box. And what also comes out of the box is more optimizations. Uh, so we've prided ourselves on our optimized payloads. If you've seen any of my talks the last uh, year or so, you've seen a lot of optimization uh, examples, a lot of data on the wire examples, but it gets even better. So uh, thanks to Jose's continued work on the Live EX engine, uh, we've had some recent optimizations that have been pretty neat. Uh, one of them is deep change tracking. So. Uh, if you didn't know that you needed this before, then congratulations, your, app, your apps are, are way more efficient than they used to be. So what we had prior to deep change tracking was just what you see on the right here, where if you had an individual assign, let's say I'm rendering a post here, a post name, username and body, and you change the one of those assigns, then everything's gonna work properly. But what folks would often do, and not incorrectly, they just weren't aware, is they would have some uh, struct like a post and they would say okay I want to render the post name and the app post dot body like on the left hand side and previously what would happen on the left hand side is changing the post uh, body would actually reevaluate everything about that post in the template because all we could say from the live EX side is okay the post changed I have to reevaluate all the elixir code and I have to send that data over the wire and this would be expensive right because the post could change for a number of reasons and if you're only changing a tiny piece of data about that post and now you have to resend the post body and all the post contents that's expensive for the server it's, it's expensive for the network uh, so what we do now is the code on the left just works and it just works like, like you would expect so um, post.name so if that works uh, for any level as well so if you did post.user.name uh, if the post user name didn't change we won't reevaluate it we won't send it so we provide uh, deep tracking now and it's just going to be optimized as you would expect it to be. So thank you, Jose, because that's that's not an easy thing to solve. And then another, another thing we did is we uh, had a, a um, issue on the Phoenix uh, issue tracker for components sending a lot of duplicate data. And uh, we, we saw that this could be uh, pretty easily optimized. So so what happened was, imagine you in a for comprehension, we're rendering a bunch of posts. Uh, so if I have like, you know, for posts and posts, render a post component. Components are great because every interaction is gonna send minimal data for that component, but that initial payload in that for comprehension would send the quote unquote template for each post within the component. So we were duplicating, and if you had a hundred posts, we were sending the same static data over and over and over for all 100 items. So what we do now, well, what we realize in that is we could actually uh, map components to their canonical static template uh, at any level. So it's not just 
for individual four comprehensions, we can optimize. Uh, we realized that for any template that we knew that we we know we've already sent to the client, we no longer have to send it at any level. So imagine you have a live view that is rendering, you know, a, a tree of components, and then they want to use some popover, or some detail view um, component, and that component static data is only ever going to be sent once uh, regardless of where it's rendered. So it's not just about a for comprehension. It's almost like uh, client side uh, templating for free on demand. So what we can do is when we send a payload to the client, the server knows what the client has. Uh, so on the left hand side, imagine you send this payload down and internally we track components by just an ID and it's just an integer. And what we can do is when we send a component down, if we know the client hasn't seen it, we'll send that static data, which is all the markup and classes, all the, all the stuff that's not Elixir code in your templates. And once we know that we've sent that for a given component, any other component that we write on the wire would just say, hey, go ask component zero for its static data. Uh, so this drastically reduces the payloads for a lot of applications. And like I said, it gives you quite, like effectively dynamic client side templating lazily loaded for free. Uh, so imagine you, if you're writing a single page app today and you, you was a large app where you didn't want to send all of your templates on page load because they're expensive, you'd have to somehow figure out, okay, I don't have this template yet when I, for this piece of data, so go fetch it. It's like you, that just falls out of the programming model. So you'll hear me say, you know, that just falls out of the programming model a lot, but this is another example where like the most optimal thing that you would end up trying to write by hand to get like the most optimized application in a single page app like just falls out of just writing applications day to day with live view. Uh, so I'm pretty excited about this uh, that just uh, just recently um, well recently landed as in it's in a pull request and I'm going to jump on a call with Jose later today to finish it but it should be there by the end of the day. And as far as what's coming very soon, uh, I know uploads have been talked about for uh, at least a year now, uh, but uh, we had to prioritize uh, some other features first. Uh, but uploads, uh, thanks to Michael Crumb's recent work on the core team, are coming along uh, quite nicely now. So I do think we'll see uploads in, in the very near, near future land in live view. And then I've been talking uh, very recently in Slack, like yesterday, uh, with uh, a separate uh, data channel for uh, Phoenix Hooks uh, because you can, you can do server client messaging over uh, PHX hook today by writing data to the DOM and reading it back, which is the recommended approach because that's uh, a way to do it without uh, having race conditions. But what we found is a, a lot of people are building live views where they're, they need to send like megabytes of data down, like uh, GPS coordinates for a, a JavaScript powered map. And uh, sending megabytes into the DOM just to pull it back out of the DOM is uh, not a great solution. So uh, we're looking into a way to make a separate data channel over the existing live view process, but in a way that uh, doesn't have the pitfalls uh, that, that we're worried about. So that's something that should land uh, quite soon as well. And then telemetry events, uh, it's in a PR, thanks to Aaron Renner at Dockyard. Um, it's just, you know, basic telemetry events that you would expect if you wanted to instrument, you know, live view mounts or uh, live view uh, events uh, that'd be in there very soon. And then as far as, you know, future work, there are a number of things that we're researching. Um, one of the one of the things that I've been playing with lately is UI transitions. Uh, so today, uh, one of the issues is if you apply a CSS class, let's say when an element is uh, added to the DOM, uh, you know, if it's a quick animation, it's going to be nice, but imagine you wanted to transition when an element is removed from the DOM, if you delete an item, for example. Uh, that's a non-trivial thing to do uh, today. Uh, you can do it uh, by, you know, rendering an empty element and applying uh, a CSS class to that. Uh, but the issue is, imagine that you're, you're starting an animation or you're using a JavaScript library that animates elements uh, for you. Uh, that will work today, but you may find that if you have frequent UI updates, so wh while an element is animating, that uh, you get a DOM patch over the wire and then that animation is stopped in the middle and the element just disappears. So there's like a lot of edge cases around uh, UI transitions today that you may hit. You, it, it may look like it works perfectly, but there are edge cases there that um, are non-trivial to solve. Uh, so that's something that we're experimenting with. Uh, so TBD on that. And then we've talked about a binary data protocol before. It's still on the issue tracker. Uh, we did have someone submit a PR, a proof of concept that uh, worked, but didn't show as much improvement uh, as far as the reduction in data payload that, that we were expecting. 
Uh, so that's still something we're evaluating because with the upload work, we have um, the primitives for uh, binary data in place. Uh, so it shouldn't be much more work to make that uh, happen, but uh, it only makes sense to do it if we can get a, a real performance win. Uh, so we're still evaluating to see if we can get that, uh, that reduced uh, further. And then another area that I don't want to rush, but uh, that it that there's a clear need. I just don't know what the full solution looks like yet, uh, uh, as far as something that we want to stick with long term. But it's like lazy and computed assigns. Uh, so today uh, there's al always requests to say, you know, when a uh, this particular assign changes, I want these other assigns to change. And our answer is always, we'll just write a function that, um, you know, mut not mutates, write a function that transforms all the assigns that are coupled. And uh, so it's doable today, but it requires a little bit of work. And then you have to go find uh, everywhere that you assigned that previous assign and move it to that function. So there is uh, a way that we want to do it in a, in a declarative way to say, you know, given these assigns, when they change, uh, you know, run this function or compute this new value. Uh, so it's just a matter of what we want that to look like and how that composes in the wild. Uh, and then other than that, there are a number of things that we're thinking about, but um, you know, I don't think worth talking about now. It's just really about um, getting uh, Live View into a stable state where we would be thinking about a 1.0 release. Uh, I don't have a timeline on a 1.0 because again, we, uh, we, we don't want to be afraid to break things at this point, but I do think the programming model, the APIs are, are quite baked at this point. It's just a matter of finding out what people are doing in the wild and then um, you know implementing to make that better. Uh, so that's all I have. Thanks a lot. That was excellent. Thanks so much, Chris. Excellent presentation. Thank You've you. got lots of questions in the meantime, but we also had Joseph Ali answering many of them uh, while oh, you were really? speaking. <laughs> so many of the questions were already addressed. We have time Fantastic. for just one more question because we have one minute left. Uh, uh, what unexpected hurdles did you encounter while building Live View? Um, uh, yeah, so the <laughs> JavaScript is the answer. Um, yeah, client side complexity. I mean, it wasn't unexpected. I guess it's exactly what I expected. Um, but it is amazing how much more complexity there is uh, with just client side development. Um, whether it's from the tooling standpoint or working with you know cross browser uh, issues. Uh, so it's not unexpected because I've been a web developer for my whole career. But um, you know, like we'll have just really bizarre bug reports. Like you know, as an Elixir developer, it's I'm pretty isolated in my my world of if there's a bug, I can go you know diagnose and fix it. But we'll have a like one of the bug reports was you know when the native select dropdown in Firefox uh, is clicked. So if, if if the native UI is shown but you patch the DOM uh, around that select box, that if you uh, if you change any attribute of that select, and then the UI is going to uh, like be buggy in Firefox. Just really weird edge cases like that where it's like a browser issue, but you can't ignore it because it's a problem, but there's no like real solution. So you end up uh, implementing hacks around just various browser quirks, which I guess is just the sum of all web development, <laughs> whether CSS or JavaScript. But uh, anyway, that's been the biggest hurdle. Uh, otherwise, um, yeah, it's been, been a pretty cool experience.